Okay, so I think I'll start. So welcome everybody. Uh, anything that you want to ask or share before before we start? So I just remind you that uh, we're meeting. We you have you are supposed to sign up for a personal meeting next Tuesday to approve your final project in the course. And uh, so if you haven't done so, please uh, do. Where uh, do we sign up? Where is the sign up uh, document? I didn't find it. You first uh, go through Yeshaya to get his approval. Oh, okay. And then you send me after, and then you send me an email, and the document is just uh, uh, emailing me. Okay. Uh, okay. Later, I'll ask you because I sent you uh, something earlier today, but so later. Okay. Okay. So I'm very happy to have uh, Paul Willutrex uh, visit us today. And he will tell us about, uh, so we are talking about data science in cell imaging. But imaging is not the only form of uh, important uh, uh, cellular information that is out there. And there is a big revolution around the uh, omics, single cell omics. And Paul and his group at, uh, at uh, Century, which is a new interdisciplinary research institute, probably Paul will tell us about it a little more, uh, will tell us about the integrating these two, uh, uh, in, uh, two different and complementary pieces of information in the context of uh, development and other applications. I just say that I, I, I met uh, Paul in uh, Israel. He was, uh, he was, he did one of his uh, postdocs in, he did one of his postdocs in uh, the US in, uh, in, uh, where was it? In uh, Princeton. In Princeton. And then the a second postdoc at the Weizmann Institute. And then, you know, there are so, so few people in the world that do this kind of stuff. So we had to meet each other and uh, even came to Passover and he, right? Passover in- uh, Yeah, in your house. Uh, yeah, so, so it's not just a, 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 we're not just going to hear a great talk, but he's also a friend. So uh, go ahead, Paul. Well, uh, yeah, thank you, Asaf. Um, so yeah, you mentioned maybe I should present uh, Century very quickly. So after my postdoc at the Weizmann, I started my own research group at the Turing Center for Living Systems in Marseille. And uh, as Asaf was saying, it's an interdisciplinary center with physicists, biologists, and computer scientists that are interested in uh, mainly development, but uh, all kinds of uh, interdisciplinary questions around um, biology and cell biology. So today I will indeed talk about imaging and multiomics. Um, so here is the outline. Uh, so quickly, I will introduce developmental biology. So please feel free to interrupt me if you know already or if things are unclear. Uh, then I will, I will maybe remind you probably with the course, you know already many things about it, but what kind of variables can we get from, from microscopy imaging and then later on with single cell transcriptomics. And um, the third part, which is the most important part, is uh, three different techniques to deal with large data set and to increase the number of variables that we can measure at the same time. So the first one will be around semi-supervised learning, the second one using optimal transport, and the third one with uh, a new technique called multi-domain translation with autoencoders. Okay. So developmental biology. So the main question in this field is to understand how you go from one cell to a complex organized and uh, autonomous uh, organism. So here is a, a movie of the zebrafish development. You see, you don't see anymore, but there are many, many cells and they're uh, undergoing proliferation. They are changing their, their identity. So towards their fate, for example, becoming muscle or nervous systems or all kinds of uh, cell types that will uh, compose the organs on. And they are moving in space also. So the tissues are folding, they're changing shape, and they're forming uh, the embryos. So now you can already see the head here with the eyes that will form there, and um, the main line here. 
the main axis, and soon you will see the heart start to beat. Yeah, here you can see the heart begins to beat. And um, then, of course, you have the, 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 the blood vessels and all the organs are forming after the heart. Okay, so um, another example is from the study of Drosophila melanogaster. Here it's another microscopy technique, which is called uh, light sheet microscopy, where you can uh, see at the same time all the cells in an embryo. So it's a 3D uh, image that's, that is captured. And here you have two projections of the same image. <clears throat> and again, you can see that there are these uh, very complex movements of cells uh, in the embryo with proliferation and tissue folding and uh, rearrangements. Uh, and at the same time, you can uh, also measure in uh, entire tissue the spatial distributions of uh, proteins and RNA. So the idea is that each of the cells here uh, have the same DNA in the beginning, and then there are changes in uh, how DNA is transcribed. And uh, those transcription dynamics are not the same for each of the cell within the tissue. And the differences in transcription will uh, lead to changes in, in cell identity. So it's important, in addition to look at the uh, morphogenetic process, to also understand what's the logic of, uh, of uh, gene expression dynamics and cell cell signaling. Okay. So all the beginning here is to give you uh, some kind of intuition of what's happening in development, if you don't have it already. The second example is again the zebrafish, but here I wanted to highlight uh, another kind of movie, which is when you have in 3D uh, each of the cell and then one reporter gene. Here in, in green, it's the protein called OEP, and you can see how uh, its expression is correlated with the changes in morphology of the embryo. And uh, this one is yet another uh, microscopy technique. So in that case, it's like sheet microscopy again with optimal tomography for the gray area. And here, only the cells that correspond to the nervous systems are stained in orange. And the rest of the body is only a white color obtained from optical, tom optical tomography. OK, so um, now that you have a bit of an idea of the dynamics, uh, just a few orders of magnitude. So if you take the C. elegans, which is one of the most studied model organism in development of biology, <coughs> you have in the adult stage uh, 1,000 cells <coughs> and about uh, 18,000 uh, different genes that are differentially expressed during development. And that leads to the various cell types uh, in the adult stage. And in comparison, in the human, you have um, 30,000 genes, which is not so much compared to the C. elegans. However, the, the complexity of the organism thus, is uh, much higher. We have 10 to the 13 cells that are distributed uh, among 200 cell types. So here, a short comparison in, it's about a uh, higher number than the number of stars in the galaxy. So, so it's quite a lot of complexity to understand. Okay, so um, <clears throat> to summarize kind of the, the big challenge that we have in developmental biology, the challenge is to understand how you go from DNA, which is the same in each of the cell, to uh, a very different phenotypes for each of the cell, which correspond to very different distributions in protein in each of the cells. And this process happens through uh, transcription into RNA and then translation into proteins. And uh, each of those products, RNA and protein, will have an effect on how DNA is transcribed. So the main question here is to understand uh, what are the dynamics of transcription in space and time during development. And a bit more uh, broadly, uh, I like to put it in this frame. Usually what we do in developmental biology is to try to understand the interaction between the dynamics of gene expression within each of the cells, the, uh, special, the special relationship of the cells within tissue and how tissues are changing over time. And at the same time, because it's a temporal process, you are uh, you want to understand how it is related to the genealogy. So how you start from a single cell that is dividing and dividing and dividing to give rise to the <clears throat> the final organs. 
Okay, so, so now I will uh, dive a little bit into microscopy imaging techniques, and then later on I will uh, talk about uh, single cell RNA sequencing. So I took this picture actually from one of the previous course by Natalie Elia in your, in your class. And I will focus on uh, fluorescent microscopy, which is the, the most common technique in, in the field. Although there are lots of uh, super resolution also microscopy, but uh, fluorescent microscopy is a bit easier to handle for a dynamical process. So um, to remind you, but probably you know, the principle of fluorescent microscopy is to uh, send photon uh, within your sample that will activate a fluorescent protein. And this fluorescent protein, after it's activated, will emit some light that you will be able to capture with your camera in the uh, microscope. And uh, what is interesting uh, uh, with those techniques of uh, fluorescent, uh, fluorescent protein uh, activate, activation is that you can usually mark different uh, tissues. So here you have uh, in blue the scales and in orange the lymphatic system and i will uh, explain you just now how you can uh, um, how you you can differentiate between those two tissues with this technique so uh, again you have this uh, main principle of uh, the activity of each of the cells so you have first the dna the then the rna after transcription and then proteins after translation and uh, you can actually uh, attach a fluorescent protein to various parts of this process and mainly to RNA or to proteins. And that way you can visualize in space where those proteins or those uh, RNA are. So the, the first uh, concept is uh, when you include in the DNA uh, sequence, a gene sequence that will encode for a uh, fluorescent protein and you will usually include this part of DNA just next to a gene that you are interested in that way when the gene is transcribed at the same time you have transcription of the fluorescent protein and therefore you can visualize uh, with the fluorescent protein where the the product so the protein of the gene of interest uh, is in space so it's exactly this technique that has been used here you have two types of uh, reporter genes, one that um, that produces a protein that will go into the nuclei, and the other one uh, will be protein that are associated to the gene uh, OEP here in green. Okay, the second big technique is called, um, sorry, I forgot to mention, this technique is interesting because you can also look at the dynamics of it. Uh, because you don't have to affect your sample it's, uh, inside its DNA, so it, it will have a normal development. But at the same time, you can visualize uh, your variables of interest. Now, uh, the second technique is called in-situ hybridization. And in that case, you will uh, put some fluorescence on the RNA. So this is kind of the scheme of how it's done. The idea is to first fix your sample, so you stop the development or you stop the activity, and then you will uh, include in your sample uh, an antibody that will attach to your uh, RNA of interest, and to this antibody you can attach also a fluorescent protein, and then when you send light on it, you will see where the RNA is in space. So this is what is done here at subcellular resolution. Um, I guess on the right you have the chromosome and on the left some uh, protein of interest, uh, RNA of interest, and here you can also do it at the scale of tissue. So here it's a mix of uh, staining the IND, which is an uh, RNA transcript, and staining uh, DPR, which is directly uh, protein. Okay. So now uh, those techniques are, are now uh, like very much available. So in, for application in machine learning in particular, you need lots of uh, data. And also uh, in biology, the processes are very complex. So it's interesting to establish databases of these kinds of images. So here I give you two uh, link to two interesting database. The one is called the Human Protein Atlas. Uh, which has uh, which has many many uh, 
different types of microscopy images that are readily available. This other one is called uh, open cell and it's focusing on the, I think it's the Hela cell. And both of them uh, are using uh, immunocytochemistry, which is similar to in situ hybridization, but with uh, the antibody that directly uh, attached to the protein. Okay, uh, the, the main limitation of those two techniques is that you, you need to fix your sample, so you need to stop the process. And also, it's quite costly, so you cannot uh, make too many of the samples in a row. Okay, so, so now we'll go through a few tasks that I think you've heard of before, before uh, talking about the question of integrating all those data sets. So the few machine learning tasks, one uh, quite famous is the question of segmenting uh, the, the microscopy images. So here at the bottom, you see the cell segmentation that is obtained from uh, the fluorescent protein uh, attached to the membrane. And uh, you, on the same, at the same time, in this movie, you can see that each of the nuclei have been uh, track, tracked in time. So I think with, uh, in one of the previous course, you had uh, an extensive uh, description of how you do tracking. So to summarize, you have um, spatial temporal cell lineage that are obtained from the image. So this is the history of cells have, how cells have been dividing over time. And you also have segmentation of individual cell from which you can uh, extract the volume and the shape of each of the cells. Uh, again, on segmentation, so, so recently there have been lots of work on how to improve segmentation with uh, different kinds of uh, deep learning architecture. So this is one based on UNET, it's called CellPose, and it's working quite well. Online, you can put your image and you get a prediction of the segmentation. Uh, another task is the classification of uh, phenotypes. So if you take two images of microscopy, uh, you can ask, or two cells within one image of microscopy, you can ask if they belong to the same uh, phenotype or if they are different. So this is a classical classification task that you find everywhere in machine learning. But uh, what I really wanted to, to tell you uh, today is how you can uh, merge the questions, sorry, the variables that you obtain from imaging, which contain uh, spatial information, sometimes time, but a limited number of genes, and how you can combine, combine first several uh, types of images to increase the number of genes. And later on, I will speak about how you can combine imaging with single cell RNA sequencing to get lots of genes together. Okay, so the, this first part will be about image data integration. So <clears throat> I will refer to uh, one uh, work that I did uh, a few years ago. Uh, and uh, I was working with data from the Drosophila development. So, in particular, I was focusing on the dorsoventral uh, patterning pathway. So please don't hesitate if you think some of the things that I'm saying are uh, unclear to you. Um, so this dorsoventral patterning pathway looks like this. There are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven variables. And all those variables have some dynamics that are uh, correlated. So some of the genes will induce the express expression of others like snail and the expression of snail with, uh, will repress the expression of thromboid. So it's important to understand the dynamics of each of those variables uh, in space and time. And the data that uh, we had was um, in situ hybridization and immunocytofluorescent uh, microscopy techniques on one hand and live movies on the other hand. So again, this is the technique that I presented you, you a few slides earlier. Uh, with in-situ hybridization, you can measure, for example, IND or rhomboid here, so the distribution of uh, transcript uh, in space. And with immunocytochemistry, you can uh, measure the distribution of proteins inside the tissue. And both of these techniques, they stop the development, so you get snapshots where you get at the same time the position of the nuclei with DAPI and the position of the proteins and the position of the transcripts. 
Now the question is to understand this uh, gene regulatory network in space and time. You need to integrate these uh, snapshots with live movies like this one. So, so how do you do? That that was the question, and uh, the answer is that you can view that as a multi-view integration uh, problem with missing data. So here is another um, representation of the same data set. So for each of the image, you get the morphology from one channel, which is called DAPI. And then you get uh, the distribution of some protein, in that case, DPIRC, some other twist, uh, and some mRNA IND or rhomboid, and some protein dorsal. And uh, each of the image, they will contain a combination of <clears throat> each of those modalities. So for example, this first image contains at the same time morphology, DPIRC, and twist. But the second image contains only morphology, DPIRC, ND, and also. Okay, so the, the aim here, here will be to complete this matrix by filling in the, the missing information that we cannot measure at the same time. So uh, one way of solving this problem is to consider it as a semi-supervised learning problem where you have on one hand images that contain two modalities. For example, DP, ERC, and nuclei, and other images that contains only one modality here, uh, nuclei. And the aim will be to use the data points that contain the two modality to learn a mapping F that goes from the nuclei to the space of gene expression in that case, and to use the learned mapping here to transfer the information uh, on the data that are missing this modality. Okay, the biological assumption, and I will show a bit later that there are alternatives to solving this problem, but the biological assumption that we used was to say that similar morphologies in uh, the space of uh, nuclei here, those two lead to similar patterns of gene expression, whereas if your morphology is different, you will have a different pattern of gene expression. So this means that when you look at a developing embryo, you can correlate how the morphology changes with the changes in patterns of uh, gene expression and use these uh, changes in morphology as a proxy for time. And, uh, and then you can map all the patterns of gene expression based on how close you, the morphology is. So that's uh, how you can explain it with your hands. And more mathematically, uh, you can, uh, Right, that each of the image here uh, lies in a space, and each of them will be called uh, x uh, from one to l for the labeled images, and from l plus one to l plus u for the unlabeled images. And similarly, you have images that are in the space of gene expression, and you call them yi to yl. And here you don't uh, really know them, but you try to predict y l plus one to y l plus uh, u. And uh, <clears throat> what we uh, did was to translate this biological assumption that two patterns of morphology, similar patterns of morphology leads to similar patterns of gene expression in this way. So we define first WIJ, which is a measure of similarity between images so yes, uh, WIJ will be a kernel on the images, which is written this way, exponential of minus XI minus XJ. So here XI and XJ are two images of uh, nuclei, and we compare how close they are. And so the closer they are, the, high, the bigger this value is. So WIJ will be very big if the images are very similar and very low if the images are very different. So this is the first term here of this um, optimization problem. And then we'll say that if two images are similar, then the patterns of gene expression that are associated to it should be very close. So we consider this loss here, which is uh, f of xi will be uh, yi, so the pattern of gene expression associated to the image xi. And similarly, f of xj will be uh, the pattern of gene expression associated to uh, xj. And what we will impose is that this quantity should be uh, very low. So that way, 
when when we minimize this uh, this optimization uh, problem, since we have a high value of um, of uh, similarity, we we will force the term that correspond to the patterns of gene expression to be very low, and that way we can predict the value of f just uh, in an analytical way. So I will now tell you a bit more. So the solution of this problem is called an harmonic extension algorithm. And you can solve it by introducing the Laplacian matrix and the sets of images in the, the space of morphology. Um, tack. So, so this is a very typical tool that people use in uh, the study of uh, manifold. And the idea is that uh, here, all your images X, they lie on some kind of uh, low dimensional manifold. And what you do is a regression on this manifold. So, so overall, this is how you can interpret this result. Um, so the, you can rewrite this uh, optimization problem as the uh, minimization of F transpose times the Laplacian times F. And you can solve it directly. And the solution is unique and it's given uh, like that with, with this uh, matrix, uh, uh, with this inverted matrix times a matrix here. Or you can also uh, write it this way, which is uh, the patterns of gene expression for the image I is equal to the average, the weighted average of the patterns of gene expression for all the images that are close by. So, so here you have a weight that tells you how far you are from this image. Well, how much, how much, how many images did you have? Uh, it was about eight hundred or one thousand, so not many images. <clears throat> and this is why. So, so uh, you think even today a deep learning technique would not be appropriate here because the amount of that data, or because right. you know, now with all these mapping uh, papers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 uh, just after I have a slide about this, but it's true that this concept is very similar to something that you could do with deep learning. Um, <clears throat> the limited number of samples that we have here would prevent totally a deep learning approach uh, from scratch. But maybe with a technique that uses uh, transfer learning, then we can probably uh, have similar results. Um, here is uh, just uh, one slide that shows uh, the preprocessing. So to compute the similarity between the images, we first uh, uh, rotate the images so they all have the same orientation. Then we did some intensity renormalization, contrast, contrast increase, all this to remove the noise that we have from data acquisition. <coughs> we applied a scattering transform that uh, also removes some uh, unwanted uh, variation. And then when the image is a point in a 784 dimensional space, so when one image is a vector and two images, you can compare them by just uh, taking the, the distance between those two or the kernel of the distance. And what I wanted to show you is that uh, if you um, perform a nonlinear dimensionality reduction on the sets of all the images using this pairwise similarity, then you actually see that you have a low dimensional manifold that um, that has an interesting structure because it's almost uh, one dimensional. And the reason is that in the process that we are looking at, the main direction of variation is time. And here, the, the different data points are organized uh, according to time on this one-dimensional manifold. So here, the different colors, they just correspond to the different data sets that we have, the different experiments that we perform. Um, so the, the color code is time? No, the color code is not time, unfortunately. The color code is uh, just a different data sets. But uh, we, we did some. I don't have the slide, yet, but we did some color coding and it was uh, really um, uh, ordered according to time points. Yeah. So why are similar? I mean, so what is the order? I mean, you see an order in the coloring. Why is it? Why is that? Yeah, the the, the coloring is correspond um, to. So one color will correspond to the images that have a deeper and untwist. 
one color will correspond to those images, one color will correspond to the movies. So we, we had um, total 1,000 images, but between those 1,000 images, we had sub-samples that correspond to different experiments. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's more clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so here I give again. Uh, yeah, and so so again, this argument that what we're doing is a, is a regression on this one-dimensional manifold. So each of the images of morphology can be uh, are lying on this one-dimensional manifold, and we are learning the function f that goes from this manifold to the space of uh, gene expression. Okay, that's uh, we showed that it is working quite well. And as you said, so there there, there is all this uh, literature that is growing now on how to do very similar uh, sort of very similar problem, but with uh, deep learning. So here is an example. You have. Uh, training data set with uh, m different experiments and for each of them you have some labels but not all of them uh, so here is an example of the different labels that you get for each of the experiment and the question is to predict an image that contains all the, the labels together um, yeah I, I just noticed now that I didn't show you but in the end what we got was a um, uh, spatial temporal atlas with the seven variables that were uh, uh, that were continuous in time. So sorry, I forgot to put the movie in the slides. And uh, yeah, and this this approach also works very well. The the question is that you need a much larger data set for to train your your neural network, but uh, probably it's a good way to go if you can com combine that with transfer learning that uh, you have on large. Uh, databases of microscopy. So again, here it calls for the need to have large database to develop the best machine learning tools to, to combine all those images together. So the, the, the take home message of this first part is that uh, in images, you can have access to some variables, which are some genes, you can have access to their spatial organization, and you can also access the temporal dynamics. But the number of genes that you can visualize at the same time is uh, rather limited. So here, even to uh, look in time at seven variables together, we had to do this quite sophisticated method of data integration. So now the question is, how can you increase the number of genes even more? And one recent technique is single cell RNA sequencing. So now we'll uh, speak about how to combine image data with single cell RNA sequencing. Okay, <clears throat> so the methodological challenge is this one. If you start with a is with an embryo with heterogeneous uh, cells, you can measure on one hand uh, lots of variables with microscopy, track them, segment the cells, and get access to special posi positions of cells, morphological features, genealogical relationship, and some uh, variables of gene expression with some reported genes. On the other hand, if you want to do single cell RNA sequencing, you have to stop the development to dissociate the tissue and then to uh, measure uh, the content in RNA for each of the cells. So you have to, you, you, what you will get is a, is a matrix where each of the uh, rows are one cell and each of the colon is one gene. So usually you measure up to 20,000 different genes and the thing is that in that case you lose the special information because you first have to dissociate the tissue and you lose the temporal information because you have to stop the development so the methodological challenge here is how do you combine those two sets of information to be able to correlate the patterns of gene expression in space with their changes in morphology or changes in uh, special organization Okay, so it's kind of the same diagram. So in the paper uh, called uh, Gene Expression Cartography by Mornitsen and uh, colleagues in 2018, they proposed a method that's quite interesting on how to use the data that is uh, coming from single cell RNA sequencing. So again, you have, you have your Drosophila embryo, you dissociate the tissue, and then you measure the content in uh, RNA for each of the cell. And you obtain this big matrix. So here it's uh, the transpose of it. 
but you have uh, for each colon one cell and for for each row one gene and from that you can measure the heterogeneity of cells okay so um so the question that they try to answer um, that they actually answered quite well in the gene expression cartography paper is can we recover the spatial distributions of cells from their transcriptomic expression so to remind you the spatial distributions of cells you usually get it from microscopy images but can you even though you, you're losing the spatial information, can you recover it just by looking at the combinatorics of uh, genes uh, between each of the cells? So the, the main assumption that they're using is that um, early in development, at least, cells that are close by in physical space have similar gene expression profiles and vice versa. So, so maybe uh, if you preserve the pairwise differences between cells from the gene expression space, then you can uh, recover the pairwise relationship in the physical space of cells and then recover the morphology of the embryos. So how to do that? Um, yeah, it's the same idea. So you have a, a matrix that is in the gene expression space and you have cell position and the aim here is to infer the mapping T that uh, takes you from the gene expression space to the physical space. So how do, what do they propose in this paper? They propose to use the framework of optimal transport. So optimal transport is a method that, uh, that uh, finds a mapping between probability distributions. Um, for example, here you have a red probability distribution, and the question is how do you transfer the red probability distribution into uh, the blue probability distribution? And, uh, optimal transport solves this problem by minimizing the distortion that you impose on the first distribution to map it to the next distribution. So the, the transport plan pi here will be equivalent to our t here is this function that says this part of the probability distribution will be spread here. Uh, this part here will be uh, the beginning of this probability distribution. And then this part here will be all distributed there and a little bit there. So, you, so uh, with my hands, the idea is that you have a first shape and you're trying to transform this first shape into a second one by minimizing the changes that you're making. And you can also generalize this concept to discrete data points. And here you have a first point cloud, and you're <clears throat> trying to transform this first point cloud into the second one by minimizing the distortion that you have between the points. So you preserve the pairwise differences between points. So <clears throat> a bit more mathematically, um, how do you infer T from gene expression data? And this is the scope of this gene expression paper the gene expression cartography paper. So first, you need to compute the pairwise distances in the gene expression space between each of the cells. So you get a matrix D uh, uh, expression, D exp, uh, which is number of, of cells times number of cells. And that way, from <clears throat> for each pair of cells, can you have an entry that gives you how far they are or how similar they are. And then you have a second matrix, which is the distance between cells in the physical space or actually between points in a grid. So, so you say your target space is some kind of ellipsoid. And for each of the area in the target space, you will have a pairwise difference. And the, the aim to infer T will be to map the distances that you get in the gene expression space to the one that you have in the physical space. So the second part is to compute T as a probabilistic map mapping between cells in gene expression space and physical location. So to do that, you will minimize a discrepancy, uh, which is called uh, the gromov wasserstein discrepancy between D X and D phys. So it's this term here, D1 of T. So here, uh, I is a, I and K are two cells in the gene expression space, and J and L are two positions in physical space. And the idea is to compare the distance between cell I and cell K 
in the expression space compared to the distance between position J and position L in the physical space uh, and compare this uh, first term and multiply it by the probability of sending cell I into position J and cell K into position L. So the mapping T will give you a probability of a cell in the gene expression space to be in a certain position in physical space. Um, in practice, to solve that, you have to, to regularize it with an uh, entropy term here. And um, you can, <clears throat> uh, and you have also to, to um, you have also to force uh, some some constraint. The constraint is that uh, if you do the sum of all the physical um, on all the physical position, you get the probability of obtaining cell i. And if you do the sum of all the cells, uh, you have to of all the cells that are sent into position j, you will have the probability of position j. And the result that they have is that uh, from the uh, 2000 genes, they can predict the position of, for example, this quantity snail. So for them, they predict that it will lie here. Whereas for Ken, it will lie on those two stripes. For Eve, it will give you a blob. And for uh, KR, it will give you one stripe. But So you see here that the prediction that you get only from single cell RNA sequencing is not so good compared to the in-situ hybridization data. So, so those are obtained from microscopy technique, where you can measure at the same time the distribution of your protein or, uh, sorry, of your RNA of interest and the shape of the tissue. So in that case, you already have the uh, special information and here you try to predict it. So only with this term, the gromov wasserstein discrepancy, you get some results that are not too bad, for example, for Ken but uh, that are not very good easier compared to the uh, results that you're trying to predict. So this is why um, they introduce a second term which contain a priori information about the potential position of each uh, of the genes in the expression space. So what they have is that they have a set of images where they know for a given gene where it's supposed to lie in physical space and they will use this information um, as a priori information that they, they will add to the optimization problem to uh, improve the prediction of T. So it's the second term here, T. And T tells you um, for a given cell in expression space I, in the expression space, so cell I, given the, the a priori information that we have on the position J, then uh, this quantity dx feed tells you, so it's the anti-correlation, so it tells you how, how close you are, or how far you are from the a priori information for each of the cells and each of the position. And you multiply it by the probability of sending the position, the cell I to the position J. And you get, in the end, um, an optimization problem here, where you try to find the transport matrix T that minimizes a combination of this first term, that is the gromov wasserstein discrepancy, so the one that tried to prefer, preserve the pairwise differences from one space to the other, plus uh, another term that gives you uh, how close you are to the a priori information that you have from an atlas. And then you have the anthropic regularization also to make it uh, 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 better to solve uh, computationally. And the results that you get with only one or two marker chains are much better compared to when you don't have any a priori information. So here it's when you use one of the genes as a reporter. So one of the genes that you obtain from in situ hybridization as a priori information. And in that case, it's when you have two uh, genes that you have from, uh, from uh, in-situ hybridization that you uh, included as uh, a priori information. So here, for example, the stripes of Eve are much better predicted. The stripe of uh, uh, KR is also much better predicted, and especially snail here, instead of having a blob that is not in the right direction, is much, well, much, more predict uh, much better predicted. 
So what do I have next? Yeah, so this is just a summary of this technique. And maybe we can have a break just after this. But um, the idea is that you have on one hand um, a gene expression data. So it's um, for each of the cell, you have a vector in 20,000 dimensions or a bit less sometimes that uh, has a, a geometry, like a manifold geometry that you can capture in some ways by looking at the pairwise similarity between the points. And in the target space, you have another uh, geometry that you have from actually the physical uh, the physical organization of the tissue. And um, the, the, the aim of this algorithm is to combine those two, so to try to map this uh, geometry that you have in the high dimensional space into the, onto the geomet geometry that you have from the microscopy images data. So the steps, uh, I didn't really mention this one, but when you compute the pairwise differences, you, you can view that as uh, inferring the graph that spans the manifold in the high dimensional space. So you get a distance matrix, each uh, of the columns and each of the rows are a cell, and for each of them you get uh, the power similarity, similar for the physical location, you can construct a graph on top of it, and for each pair of so locations. The, the, distance, the distance, what exactly, Paul? The distance in the, in the graph, in the network? Yeah, so, so here, if you use the Euclidean distance in the 20,000 dimensional space, so just um, a simple pair, uh, simple distance, right? Uh, just comparing the two vectors, you will have lots of noise. And because of the high uh, dimensionality, you have the so-called curse of dimensionality. So it's not very <clears throat> uh, precise. And it, it will not really recover the actual organization of the points in the high dimensional space. So what we usually do is to take the k nearest neighbor and uh, just construct a graph on top of this one. So say uh, the, you have for on each of the edges of the graph, the proximity between those two uh, cells that you can compute either with Euclidean distance or with a cosine similarity. So you have several uh, possibilities here. And then, um, and then you obtain the graph from this. So just by looking at the k nearest neighbor for each of the cell, you will have some proximity. And the other, you you put the proximity to zero. So then, so I'll just tell the class that this is basically this is what we have seen in uh, this is a technique from Dana Dana Pears lab, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's similar. So Dana Pears is using uh, TSNE usually, but it's the same idea. Yeah, it's the manifold. Uh, approximation so so how to get the geometry of your data points in high dimension yeah exactly yeah, and so it, when, it were also used in uh, <coughs> in fact to uh, to define pseudo time in cell cycles we, we've seen that in the in the course right exactly so so there is this whole literature of people that are doing nonlinear dimensionality reduction using tsne you map cell rank uh pseudo time inference they most of the time they 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 try to measure a graph on top of the data in high dimension and from this graph they can uh, recover the geometry and find the parameters that best describe uh, the changes along this shape okay and so then when you have those two graphs those two pairwise differences you do the optimal matching using the Wasserstein, the Gromov Wasserstein the discrepancy. And um, you can use the reference atlas here to improve uh, the, the predictions that you're making. And in the end, you get a probabilistic embedding of uh, where your cell is supposed to be in physical space. So the difference with what Dana Per is doing is that uh, our similar uh, literature is that from the high dimensional gene expression space, they act into a low dimensional embedding, which is a latent space. And so sometimes you can recover information about the physical location, but it doesn't have to be the, the, the case. Whereas here, they uh, enforce that your low dimensional embedding that you have from the high dimensional uh, gene expression data uh, is supposed to match with the target tissue. So they are forcing kind of the, the projection. It's as if you were doing PCA, but instead of saying PCA in the plan, you say PCA on a tissue. 
And uh, and this last part here is the assumptions that I was telling you that is not always true, but that is true in Drosophila at this stage, which is that the distances in physical space are similar to the distances in the gene expression space. Okay, so okay, so maybe one more slide and then uh, we can take the break. So the, the other limitation that we have with this gene expression framework is uh, that it doesn't combine uh, time to the story. So you are just inferring a mapping. I mean, just you are already inferring a mapping from the gene expression space to the physical space, but you are doing it at one time point and you're not looking at the dynamics of it. So one uh, small, um, uh, improvement that uh, we proposed was to um, consider the case where you have expression profiles at different time steps and uh, morphology at different time steps and how do you infer the mapping T so that it doesn't change too much. So in, the, in that paper, what we just did was to add a term here that tries to minimize the changes in T over time, so you said that your mapping from expression space to physical space uh, will not vary a lot according to time. So the assumption is that your processes are continuous, so you will not have big changes. And, and then we solved this problem with uh, instead of uh, purely uh, tr optimal transport, we did a gradient descent, and we found that we could recover simple dynamics in high dimensional space and find them in the low dimensional space. Well, I'm missing here something because how do yeah. you how do you have expression profiles over time? Right. So, so it's in the case where, um, it's, for example, I think I saw quickly in the TVNS, no, in one of the other presentations. So, for example, if you if you take the single cell RNA sequencing uh, profiles of a developing embryo at different time points after 10 minutes, after an hour, after two hours, you will have snapshots at these different time points. And for each of them, you can do this gene expression cartography uh, technique on each of the time points. But then if you consider only, um, uh, can I edit just, yes. Uh, if you remove this term in the beginning, uh, so this is the gene expression framework, gene expression category framework here, you will have an invariance to rotation and translation, so you will not be able to capture the dynamics. And uh, moreover, there are some uh, parts of it that are uh, stochastic, so if you take two time points, you might have some, some variation that are just coming from uh, the gene expression category part. Um, I don't know if it's more clear, so the idea is that they they would consider um, they would consider the the this problem here, which is the gene expression category, separately at one time point and at the other time point. But then, if you compare the t at one time point to the t at the other time point, um, they a priori they will not have any uh, shared information between the two. So you can have big variation or you can even miss simple transformation that are not captured in this. If you preserve the pairwise differences between your cells here, then uh, and the pairwise differences are preserved, but the, the whole point clouds have shifted somehow, then you will not capture it with this just um, with the first op um, optimization problem. So this is why we thought it could be interesting to um, discuss what happens if you uh, include a regularization on how T is supposed to change, because in that case, you will be able to capture rotation that will not change the pairwise differences, so that will not affect this first term, but that will uh, change the, the, the value of T. Okay, so yeah, it's, uh, this one last slide is a bit technical, but overall, the here, the take-home message is that uh, you can combine the information that you have from single cell RNA sequencing technique to the information that you can get from in situ hybridization, which are images and contain also the space together to generate uh, high dimensional atlases at a given time point with gene expression cartography 
you can try to uh, include the dynamics, but this is very preliminary for now. <coughs> and the uh, technique that has been used until now are relying highly on the geometry of the data points in high dimensions. So it's similar to what you were mentioning earlier, Asaf, which are uh, temporal ordering, so the time I mean, are um, similar to the, <coughs> the TSNE method or the cell rank method. So the, you're trying to transform a graph into another, but in that case, by, by including the, the constraint on uh, how it should look like in the low dimensional space. Okay, so, so now for the next part, I want to switch a bit topic. So I suggest we take a break now. Okay, so we'll be back in uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. Which to PDF presentation? Yes. <laughs> I will now just introduce with this one slide and then it's to the another document. Okay, I think we can start. Okay, so, so until now, I presented how you can measure information from microscopy imaging, then combine several types of microscopy imaging techniques to increase the number of variables that you can measure at the same time. Then I presented how you can combine single cell RNA sequencing techniques to microscopy imaging to increase even more the number of variables that you can measure at the same time. Now I want to discuss a little bit a recent paper that has been published on how you can combine, uh, in addition to RNA sequencing data that are uh, attack sec, so that measure the changes in chromatin, the high C that also measure um, changes in chromatin of the DNA, and imaging data. So, so now it's really what we call uh, multi-omics. So RNA sequencing would be transcriptomics, attack sec would be uh, another type of omic, and together they form uh, what is called multi-omics together with imaging data. But in that case, um, <clears throat> the scope of this paper is really at the scale of the single cell. So we will not use any more the underlying idea that cells are within a tissue, but instead focus on uh, one single cell. So here, the, the part A, I don't know if you see my mouse, maybe I should use the laser pointer. This part here <clears throat> shows what you can measure from a cell. So a cell is a very complex system. You can image it to, to look at where the DNA lies within the cell, for example. You can uh, measure the content of uh, RNA within each of the cell. You can measure uh, the position of histones, and you can measure how the DNA is organized in 3D. Okay, and uh, the idea of this paper is to uh, combine these different aspects by using coupled uh, autoencoders. So I am assuming that you're familiar with the idea of autoencoders, uh, but uh, stated very quickly, an autoencoder is a deep learning uh, structure or architecture where you give an input. The, uh, the, the architecture would encode the information into a lower dimensional layer and then decode it and try to reproduce the input without loss of uh, information. So it's a way of uh, compressing the information. And the idea uh, here is to use this autoencoder in each of the different uh, modalities uh, such that the intermediate layer, so the, the one that uh, encodes the maximum information, in the lower dimension is of the same dimension between the different modalities. And therefore, the points that are measured in the different modalities can be compared into the same latent space here such that you can go then from RNA sequencing data to imaging data or from RNA sequencing data to attack sec data. So <clears throat> to give you an idea, uh, here bottom left, you have the autoencoders, the structure, so it can be on images uh, with convolutional neural networks or on uh, RNA sequencing 
with more simple uh, autoencoders, and then you can combine the encoder of one modality to the decoder of the other modality. For example, if you take single cell RNA sequencing um, data, and you can uh, turn it into image data, and vice versa. If you take an image data, you can encode it and decode it as uh, transcriptomic data. So this is the results of the paper. If you have the distribution of the RNA sequencing data, then you <clears throat> encode it into a latent space that is uh, shown here uh, with a principal component uh, projection and similar for the images. And you see that uh, the, the points that are coming from transcriptomic and images, they will overlap. And from that, you can predict the you can predict images from the single, from the RNA sequencing data and vice versa. From the real images, you can predict the RNA sequencing data. Okay, so I will switch, uh, as said, to the PDF presentation to give you the technical. What, what paper is it for? Yeah, uh, the reference will be here. So this paper is called multi-domain translation. Oops, sorry, I didn't download the latest version. So this is the, the archive paper, but since, since then it's on uh, nature communication. It's called multi-domain translation between single cell imaging and sequencing data using autoencoders. And it's from the lab of Caroline Uller at MIT. Uh, so to, to try to understand it, I will, uh, start from from a bit of background so this is what i just said the cell you can measure with microscopy rna chromatin accessibility 3d organization of dna then you can uh, the aim is to integrate all those different modalities into one single latent space so you can translate the information from each of them or you can even find correlation between uh, each of the modalities that you cannot acquire uh, at the same time Okay, so so to understand this paper, we need to take a step back and go through CycleGAN. So I don't know how much you're familiar with CycleGAN, but I'm betting that uh, since you are in the CS department, maybe it will not sound too complicated if we describe the concept. So the idea of CycleGAN is to, um, is it better this way maybe, uh, is to learn a mapping that uh, can translate an image from one domain to the other. So here, the example is from summary data to uh, winter uh, data and vice versa. Uh, sorry, here on the left, it's, it's gonna be winter data and you translate it into summer data and here winter to summer and here summer to winter, summer to winter. So it's uh, the idea of cycle again. So, Okay, so CycleGAN learns two mapping, one that goes from one domain to the other, and the other one that goes from the other domain to the first one. And uh, the main assumption of this uh, architecture is that you have uh, X uh, is equal to the first mapping applied to the second mapping uh, of the same image, and you should have a consistency. So it's some kind of autoencoder, but a bit uh, tweaked. It's called the cycle consistency loss. So more precisely, you have the first domain here, for example, the images in the summer, the second domain here, for example, the images in the winter, and you're learning a mapping from one to the other and from the other to the one. And um, okay, so you have uh, two things. First, you, you will have a cycle consistency loss, which means if you start from the first domain, you apply the first transformation, then you go from the second domain to the first one, you have the second transformation, so J and F, and you want that when you go back and forth, you are as close as possible from your initial point. And if you start from the second domain, you want also to be as close as possible to your initial point. And in addition to that, you introduce uh, two adversarial uh, discriminators. So this is how you train it, right? So you, you have this cycle consistency loss and another loss that is a discriminative loss uh, where you you have a discriminator. So, so an instance that will tell you with probability between zero and one, if the data is coming from your domain or if the data is a 
transformation of uh, a point that was in the other domain into your domain. Um, tack, so, so if we take mapping by mapping, so the first mapping J will be um, <clears throat> uh, will be learned, or at least there will be the first constraint, which is the constraint of a GAN, of a generative adversary network, where you try to find J that is optimal and that minimizes this loss, which is composed of the log of a uh, discriminator that tries to tell if the data is from its own domain, plus uh, the loss that tells you if the data is coming from the other domain and has been uh, translated. So, so here you will have um, a training that takes two concurrent aspects, the, the, value, the function j that tries to fool the discriminator and the discriminator that tries to uh, discriminate between the case where the data comes from its domain. So, so for example, if the data is summer or if the data is uh, coming from winter but transformed into summer. Okay, and for f, you can have the same adversary loss. So overall, uh, the cycle consistent. Okay, sorry. So this was the first loss that you need to use to define uh, this architecture. And the other one is called the cycle consistency loss, which I just described, which says that you want to minimize as much as you can this part here, which is that uh, the if you go from one domain to the other and back to the first one, you will be as close as possible to your initial point and similar from the other domain. If you put the two together, you will have two uh, loss that correspond to the to the GAN loss. So how to learn J and the discriminator D here, and the cycle consistency uh, loss that says that when you come back, you want to be as close as possible to X. So the <clears throat> the cycle GAN uh, solve this problem by saying that you want to minimize this whole loss over j and f and maximize it over dx and dy so you want your discriminator not to be fooled but you want a function that fools them as good as possible uh, okay so so keep this in mind because this is very similar to what's happening in the multi-domain translation by uh, learning auto uh, uncoupled auto encoder so i think there are there are uh, about three papers with similar names and the last one was in nature communication in uh, january 2021 okay so if we go back to the problem that we have we have we said we have uh, one domain which can be rna sequencing the other one, which can be um, attack sec, the other one high C, and the other one images. So you can uh, denote them by first domain x1, x2, x3, x4. And for each of them, you want to learn an autoencoder um, that goes into a latent space of the dimension, a given dimension. And for each of them, you want the same dimension for the autoencoders. So the, the idea would be that each of the points, they are translated into a common space. And this common space will uh, uh, will be as such that the points coming from each of the modality will be superimposed. Uh, okay, so a bit of math. I don't know how much we should uh, go into this. the The idea is that each of the domain they are a function of some common underlying latent variable z. So if you look at your system from a microscopy point of view or a RNA sequencing point of view, you're actually looking at uh, different functions of the same underlying or latent variable Z. Um, so that will be kind of the idea. Um, <clears throat> Xi is a function of the latent variable Z plus some noise here. And then uh, you can couple all those variables and the coupling will be like the, the probability distribution of uh, all the variables together uh, can be written as the product of the probability distribution of each of the variable given uh, the latent variable. Uh, this is a bit of uh, graphical models. Anyways, uh, what you get now is that uh, Sorry, so, so you have this model in mind, which is that each of your modality are a function of similar latent space, 
and you want to learn those autoencoders such that they, you can infer the function from the latent space to each of the modalities. So how to learn the autoencoders? You have a pair of encoder EI, a decoder DI, that uh, the encoder goes from your uh, original space to the latent space, and the decoder goes from the latent space to the original space. And what you do is you minimize the first loss that tells you how accurate your encoding decoding uh, uh, process is. And the second one will tell you how close the distribution of point into the latent space is to the probability distribution of the latent variables. So <clears throat> here, uh, this uh, symbol here shows that the encoder acts as, uh, um, sorry, it uh, applies transport on the probability distribution of your points in the original space into the latent space. So this is the transport of the probability distribution P X I, and you compare it to the uh, probability distribution of the latent variable Z and the noise associated to one of the modality. And uh, if you, yeah, and uh, this, this uh, loss here, you can uh, describe it uh, as so a discriminative loss, as in the case of the cycle GAN. So you have a discriminator F here that will uh, try to discriminate between points that are coming from the latent distribution P of Z versus the points that are coming from the transport through the encoder. So, so this is exactly what uh, this term does. So there is a trade-off between encoding as well as you can and decoding as well as you can the data from the original space. And when you are in the latent space, you want to be as close as possible to a common latent variable. Uh, yeah, that's the algorithm. So just uh, it's how this idea is implemented. So you have um, a gradient descent when you minimize the, the encoding part. And, um, and then you have a gradient ascent when you, you maximize the discriminative part. So you alternate between those two aspects. So the results. Sorry, I thought I would take a bit longer, but I think it's good. The results, so, so this is what I already showed you. You have the data that uh, is usually in high dimensional RNA sequencing, so 20,000 dimensions. Then you use TSME, low dimensional embedding. You see the shape of uh, your data points. It, using the autoencoder, you have the shape of the latent space here with two modalities. And from that, you can predict images. The other way around, you have your images, you have the encoder part, you project them uh, into the latent space, you see also two modalities, and from that you can predict the RNA sequencing data. And in both cases, you see that it's very similar. So the RNA sequencing data that you actually measure versus the one that you can predict from the images is not too different. And similarly, the the, the one that you the images that you predict from RNA sequencing is not so different from real images. Um, tech. So so. I think for me, there are two main limitations. The first one is, or at least three. The first one will be that you're working with single cell uh, images. So in my case, since I'm interested in embryos, this is a bit limiting, but I'm thinking now about extension to, extension to uh, tissues. The second one is that it seems here that the, um, the processes, so there are two main modalities. <clears throat> and uh, how to say the the precision of the outcome seems to predict those two modalities. So, so in technical terms here, the difference between the types of images is that one will have DNA overall, so the chromatin is open, and the other one, the chromatin is closed, so DNA will be only on one part of the image, which we don't see so well, but we see a bit better in the paper. Uh, but this this case is very simple, and I think uh, in many data. Um, Cell, uh, single cell assays, we have much more complicated phenotypes. So, so we need to see if this applies well to other contexts. And the third aspect that I think is limiting is the fact that for now, there is no question of uh, 
dynamical data. So I will just uh, use the remaining of the time to give you a proposition on how to capture the temporal uh, information. And to do that, I will discuss uh, what is called recycled GAN. So recycled GAN is an extension of cycled GAN. Uh, yeah, I have a video, but it's okay. I, I will not show it, but it's those videos where you see, for example, Barack Obama. Sorry, it's starting on my laptop. So it's this kind of video where you have Barack Obama say a speech by Martin Luther King or things like this, where you can transfer style from another videos in time. So so the, the most classical architecture to do that is called Recycle Gun. So this is cycle GAN. I told you, you have one mapping from one domain to the other, and you try to be as close as possible to the first one. In recycle GAN, you add another uh, aspect, which is a temporal predictor, Px, and a temporal predictor, Py, in each of the space. And in addition to be able to go back to your initial points, you want also to be consistent with temporal dynamics within each of the space. So you will try to predict the time sequence in each of the space. <clears throat> and uh, have it consistent with the mapping from one space to the other. So more precisely, you still have the same um, the, the same uh, adversarial loss uh, in each of the space to encode as, as well as you can uh, the data from the other uh, domain. The cycle consistency loss, which tells you that if you go from one domain to the other and back to your domain, you're as close as possible to the initial point. And you add another uh, loss, which is called recurrent loss, which is a how to learn a temporal predictor, which predicts future samples in a stream given its past. So if you're in one domain, you have a time series of, say, 10 points. You use the first nine points, and from that, you infer a function p here that would predict the 10th point and uh, and you try to minimize like, uh, the accuracy of this prediction when you have a, a, a set of time series so it's the recurrent loss and then finally the recycle loss is how this recurrent loss or this uh, temporal predictor will be consistent with the encoding and decoding part so if you have a time series in one domain then you will uh, first uh, translate this first point into the other domain, then use the temporal predictor that you've learned in the second domain, predict the next point, go back in the first space, and then compare the results with the next time point in the in the first domain. So this is how you do recycle GAN. Complete formulation is a trade-off between all those loss. The first one is the discriminative loss on the uh, encoding parts and decoding part. Then the... Um, the recurrent losses that uh, predicts uh, the temporal predictor, Py, Px, and then you have uh, the recycle loss, so how your temporal predictor is consistent with the encoding decoding. And that way you can predict uh, how Barack Obama will speak like Martin Luther King. So, so to conclude, I guess on this part, um, the perspective, and I think uh, an interesting extension of the extension of the paper by Euler will be <coughs> to combine uh, these uh, coupled autoencoders with a temporal predictor. So you can learn a temporal predictor in the latent space, and then you can translate a um, time series from one space to the other. So, so I think that would be quite interesting, especially in the field of development where everything is about time. So, are you working on that? I, it's in the pipes, so slowly, but uh, at least uh, the yeah the theoretical part. I think it's consistent. Then it's going to be a bit hard to find data that that would work well on this. But uh, yeah. oh yeah, that was my second question. So, how are you going to find data for that? Yeah, exactly. Because if you want a high temporal resolution, so 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 for now, I mean, you ha there, there exists lots of time series of uh, transcriptomic data. Um, the thing is that uh, you would like to find one that is consistent with uh, changes in phenotypes, also. So yeah, I'm I'm thinking about it. Uh, okay, so I want to finish. 
with the two points that uh, uh, I would like to make as the one that are interesting. So I should do to remind again, uh, first that with uh, microscopy images, you can get lots of information and especially spatial information, but also temporal information, uh, be it at the subcellular resolution or tissue resolution. <clears throat> so microscopy is very important. You can have temporal data. So temporal data is extremely important in development, in cancer biology, in disease. Um, and microscopy imaging addresses these two aspects. Uh, the, as I think it's a very interesting frontier now to really combine images and omics. The two types of data are quite large in different ways. Images are high resolution, they're very big in terms of storage. The omics data are usually in very high dimensions and quite complex with uh, some structure in the data. So <clears throat> those two fields could be quite fruitfully uh, combined. The, for the machine learning community, there are many, many tasks that are only on images that are now coming into microscopy images like segmentation, classification. In, in the omics field, uh, lots of machine learning community revol revolves around um, nonlinear dimensionality reduction, manifold learning, how to parameterize the data from single cell RNA sequencing. But the, the two communities, I mean, I think there is some space between the two communities. And it's quite new, but we need to define the tasks quite well also. So I think that it's, uh, it's quite an uh, interesting area. And I think yes, that was it uh, for today. So what, what do you think about the, uh, so with all these uh, huge data collections that are coming out now, but focused on, you know, focus, most of them are focused on images. When you see all this, uh, the, all, all the ones that you showed about organelles and, uh, you know, the yeah. EM and then the open, open cell and then the Ellen Institute, so all of them are imaging data. The Ellen Institute has already one data set with another modality. I think I, I actually we talked about it at some point. But what do you think? I mean, do you think that one of these giants is going to produce uh, the atlas that will allow you to do your stuff? Or otherwise, how are you planning to? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so first, uh, I think it's very good and interesting that all those image databases are emerging now, because for many years, the, this community was not very well organized. The, I think in omics data, and especially RNA sequencing data, they are all online also, like people are, have lots of uh, repository. Um, since I'm mainly interested in developmental biology, I think uh, we're not there yet completely, like it's mainly single cell, so, so I will wait a bit and see how this is uh, coming. But uh, yeah, it's true that, that there are many teams that are working on, on, on omics data and now they're including image data. So um, yeah, I didn't really answer your questions, but I'm, I'm just uh, looking very closely at what's happening. Like it's hard to and, and any thoughts about uh, spatial transcriptomics? Right, so spatial transcriptomics is, uh, is a good way to check this integration data uh, techniques, I think. The main limitation that I find with it is that you have to cut your sample usually, so it's quite invasive. And also it's usually one slice or you can do multiple slices like this to get 3D uh, reconstruction. But yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very nice field uh, also, yeah, so... In that case, the, the problem is solved uh, at the moment where you, you're doing the, the data acquisition, but uh, I don't think it, it, it uh, makes any of this uh, irrelevant, quite the contrary, actually. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, yeah, that was about it. Uh, so, I think, I don't know if they're still connected, but we have Marek, for example, who is a PhD student in the team. He's working on this. And uh, we have Florian, who is an intern for the summer. but the the tricky question the tricky thing and i think maybe as if you have the same problem is that it's quite sophisticated in terms of math and ml but you need also to understand the biology of it so so 
it's a bit tricky to convince like people to work on this field so when compared to the machine learning pure machine learning where you have mnist or the face data sets and the questions are very well established and you can improve the, the algorithm yeah but uh, yeah no i think it's very interesting well this is an advantage of being in a computational in applied computer science department and so yeah. i was surprised people people are interested so uh, people want to do something meaningful and uh, you know not just uh, well yeah yeah of course yeah yeah i think and I saw the, the basic the basic uh, building blocks of life is uh, it's pretty exciting it's more exciting than uh, doing data science on twitter feeds sorry that yeah, you I, think I, the people are doing data science on twitter feeds actually um, i think yeah. that all just described the whole purpose of this course <laughs> right in one sentence yeah yeah and uh, and i also saw that uh, in in the machine learning uh, conferences people are starting to say the data sets that everyone uses seem to be a bit obsolete now like <laughs> we're, we're getting a bit tired of always doing uh, classification on the same images and comparing the algorithms so so i think maybe those data sets from biology that uh, people are building at the moment will also go slowly into the machine learning community i mean at least i hope uh -huh. Well, I don't know, but maybe. Yeah. I mean, you saw that in the, for example, the segmentation uh, competitions, right? That then, and then they came out like three, four, like major papers with new ideas on how to right. segment the cells, right? I mean, so this is this is the, going from the computer science to to biology. From it's the other way around, there are not many examples, but uh, yeah, unit is like the best. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. But uh, but also, yeah, as you said in your in your perspective, for example, that you wrote, the the segmentation task is very low level compared to the part that are more about uh, interpreting the data. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's good. It means there is a a future for us. No, I think it's very exciting. I mean, this yeah. uh, I, I really like it, and I think it's 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 quite big. Uh, by the way, I'll do a promotion for you actually before I forget. So Megan and I are organizing a subgroup in ASTB, next ACB, okay. on actually on, on, on the future of using these huge data sets, these massive data sets, because they are generated, but I don't see almost anyone that are actually trying to use them and integrate them. Right. So maybe you should think about submitting an abstract. Yeah, you should. Uh, can you send me the, the ad to it? Yeah, there is no ad yet. We it just oh. they accepted last week. So okay, okay, okay. Well, uh, yeah, great. But, but you should be there for sure. I mean, it's in December, it. right? In uh, in Philly, it's huh? in Dece it's in December usually. As he's been yeah, there. but it's virtual this year, so it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, of course. Okay. Fantastic. So thank you so much. Any questions? Thoughts? Okay, uh, so Toda Raba, Paul, and uh, I think you. we can go to, to an early break and come back at uh, four and we'll have uh, student lectures and I'll, I'll talk a little bit. Great, thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye. Paul? <laughs> Yeah, man, yeah. It's a very important thing. 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 זאת אומרת, המפלצות שיש להן מעבדות של עשרה פוסט-דוקטורנטים וזה, זה... ושמייצרים את הדאטה כבר, זה נראה לי קצת, קצת עמוס זה הולך להיות שם, אבל זה, זה, זה נראה לי הולך להיות תחום מאוד תחרותי, אבל הוא, הוא מאוד חשוב, הוא הולך להיות שם גילויים חשובים בשנים הקרובות. אוקיי, אז let's continue. And Amit and Iftah, now it's your, your turn. Just a second.
So you can see the screen? Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Great, so hi everyone, my name is Amit. I'm going to present this paper together with Iftah. Um, this is, hi Iftah, this is Great. a very recent paper. It was published about a month ago, which is pretty cool. It also um, offers a pretty um, uh, initiative, I think, approach. Uh, it called, it calls, um, its name is Regression Plane Concept for Analyzing Continuous Cellular Processes with Machine Learning. So let's start. So in cell biology, the classic approach tends to divide uh, biological processes into stable steady states that can be observed, observed by an expert. But biological processes are in most cases continuous. For example, we already talked about it in cell cycle. Um, there are known steady states, but there are also um, continuous transitions between the steady states. So the chance of a phenotypic discovery is significantly restricted by discretizing them. When an expert annotates the data um, that contains continuous transitions, he might find it very hard to identify discrete states, which is leading to faulty decisions when it comes to uh, the case of samples with interclass properties. For example, so you can see over here um, that an expert might, might identify very clearly class A or class B, but will find it pretty hard to identify the interclass um, or define an interclass stage when we're talking about a continuous process. So the motivation here is pretty obvious, and it is the need for a framework that enables analysis of biological process in a continuous and unrestricted manner. About the related work, a few uh, words. So there are two types of tools that are existing. Both suffer from um, hard limitations, such as the lack of expert interaction when it comes to unsupervised approaches, or the lack of the, lack of the ability to identify interclass stages of a continuous process when you're talking about the supervised approach. As we said earlier, and again, going back to the same element you saw, looking at a biological process as a series of steady states restricts the outputs to a single dimension. And the regression line you can see over here. That means that for some processes, looking at a single dimension might not be enough. Um, restricting the output to a single dimension does not allow to model branching or circulating or parallel processes. Um, and therefore, the authors propose a new approach that is called regression plane, or RP in short. They extended the approach to utilize also two-dimensional plane that enables modeling such processes, as I said. Cellular steady states are the nodes of the graph, um, and the gradual changes between the steady states are the edges. As you can see over here. The regression plane in general uh, represents a good trade-off between um, visual visualization capabilities and annotation complexity uh, for the biological experts. We would expect the authors to support their selection of a two-dimensional plane uh, by comparing the one-dimensional one uh, plane or three-dimensional uh, performances of planes, but they haven't. Now I'm going to describe in the general pipeline of this approach, but note that this is an only general uh, workflow that represents a methodology and not a single model. Both the regression algorithm and the post-process analysis can be adapted to the biological question or challenge. So this is the first step, uh, the data preparation for the training, uh, which includes several steps. The first one is copying out uh, single cell images out of the time, time lapse data. And then the, hack, the expert has to uh, use some specialized tools such as cell profiler uh, to do feature extraction, segmentation, even illumination correction, etc. 
Then the expert uh, prepares the annotations for the training set samples by positioning the samples on the regression plane. So for every training sample, the expert assigns coordinates that correspond to the position of the sample in the biological process uh, instead of determining, determining a single steady state. The positions um, are determined relatively to the beginning of the process or to the end of the process, as believed by the expert. So you can see here in A, the training set is a full mapping of uh, the training samples to the regression plane. Next, a regression plane, a regression model, um, which can be selected by the user, is trained to receive a sample and then predict its position over the plane. Then a full regression plane is created using the predictions of the model on all of the samples. And only then, the trained model can be used to perform a further analysis um, to actually derive some biological insights. Uh, in these examples, features are extracted from the generated regression plane using KDE. Uh, and then they were trying to differentiate between effects of treatments. If that will discuss it in a minute. Let's yeah, continue. so uh, hey, uh, we'll uh, go over uh, some of the experiments that they did. Uh, the first experiment that the uh, author conducted was an attempt at a uh, proof of concept of, of sorts. They generated a synthetic high content screen in image data set, simulating uh, perturbations of cell shapes and protein expression, expressions to model six different bio biological processes. You can see that on the left image. Uh, in the right image, uh, we can see the designed uh, cells transformation processes. Each white line corresponds to a single transformation. Uh, then 10 microscopy expert, experts were divided into two groups and asked to identify uh, the distinct underlying processes. Basically, they were asked to define image sets containing uh, cells or cell, cell trajectories uh, with uh, similar behaviors. One group, group used the, the regression plane uh, method and the other didn't. Uh, thank you. Uh, here we can see uh, the regression planes that were generated by the experts that use the, uh, uh, the regression plane uh, method. We can see that the results are, are pretty good in identifying the distinct processes. Uh, another click, please. Uh, the experts uh, that used regression plane performed better in estimating the, the number of processes uh, and achieved on average uh, an improvement of approximately 20% in precision and 5% uh, in uh, recall. Moving on. Uh, the system was uh, used in, uh, in real life experiments to try and extra extract biological inferences, which is uh, what we are actually interested in. So uh, we will now show two analyses uh, uh, performed uh, uh, on different real life biological domains. Uh, and uh, the usage of the methodology in different domains uh, substantiates the, the robustness of, of this method. So uh, the first uh, test uh, was uh, mitosis uh, data analysis, which is a cell cycle analysis. Uh, in A, you can see uh, a regression plane represented, represented the process of mitosis. This is the training set that was used. After prediction shown in B and D, uh, the cells followed the designed uh, circular path following the mitotic phases. They also represented, represented phenotypic changes and single cell differences in the regression plane. Uh, we can see that in D. In D, uh, there is the uh, regression plane with all the predict predicted cells. The color, the ar arrows, point to different known stages within the cell cycle. Another very interesting real life experiment uh, that they did was using the system on lipid droplet dataset. They evaluated whether perturbations of uh, candidate genes would affect the morphology of lipid droplets. Lipid droplets are uh, storage units for uh, natural lipids, including triglycerides, triglyceridum, let me share it here, uh, that play a significant role in, in several uh, major disorders, such as uh, cardiovascular diseases. Uh, here we can see in A, uh, that, that is a training set uh, that was designed by a field expert uh, who placed uh, 450 cells uh, on the regression plane. In B, we can see uh, the regression plane output for two different uh, treatments, two different uh, perturbations. 
And in C, we can see uh, the different uh, analysis uh, performed on the uh, regression plane output. Uh, we can see here, uh, as uh, Amit uh, said earlier, in C, on the top image, we can see the uh, high content screening analysis. And they used uh, KDE to extract features from the regression plane. And then they used PCA to visualize uh, uh, the, uh, the results of, of, the, of, of KDE. As, uh, as we can see, uh, the analysis automatically identified the three perturbations, the red, green, and white, uh, three different treatments that, eff that affect the morphology of uh, lipid droplet droplets, which is actually very cool because that is what we are inter interested in. We, we, uh, we managed to, to arrive at a biological uh, insight using, uh, using this method. Uh, let's move on uh, and talk about the strength and limitation of the, of the proposed approach. Um, first of all, uh, let's talk about the strengths. Uh, the uh, regression plane uh, method uh, integrates uh, into uh, the high content screen analysis pipeline, as we've as we, uh, seen, uh, and, and provides uh, an additional tool uh, to analyze the data. Uh, next, the, the method enables the usage of uh, various regression models and a variety of uh, active learning techniques to, to help with the, uh, with the learning. Uh, and uh, as we said earlier, the method was used uh, on uh, three different data sets and a synthetic data set, uh, showing the, the robustness of, of this method, of the methodology uh, of using the regression plane. Uh, the limitations, uh, there are quite a few, but what we go over uh, several of them. Uh, first of all, the results are, are this is the, the, the most major one. The results are highly dependent on the expert, both on the modeling of the, of the regression plane, of the training set, and on the interpretation of the results. Uh, we would expect uh, to show uh, that the author would show different, uh, uh, how different modeling of different experts would affect the results, but, but they haven't. Uh, and the next uh, big limitation, or, or it's part of the design, but it, it it forms uh, a limitation of sorts is that the classical uh, pre-processing steps in the high content screening are still required, still needed. We, we have to do segmentation and feature extraction, and only then we can use regression plane. And from the generated regression plane, we need to extract features uh, to, to analyze the, the data. Um, that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we would like to uh, answer them. You? Any thoughts? So the, the only real validation that they had is that they, it, uh, using the simulations and showing that they can predict uh, yes. which uh, trajectory, right? So, so I asked you when you presented, uh, maybe you said, but then I missed it now. Is it, how do they extract the, what is the input to the, to the classification? So the input is the uh, cell's uh, trajectories or, or timeline, in each individual cell over time, and, the, and its features, uh, the, extract, the segmentation features and the extract features uh, that they used, they, they uh, insert it to the uh, regression plane. And after, after training, they use the regression model on those features, predict their position on the regression plane, and then use the position on the regression plane of all the cells to extract the uh, uh, to, to analyze the, the effects, the different effects. How? Oh, so they have a basically they have a trajectory in 2D space over time. Right? Yes, they have a trajectory the, in, in, the, in this plane over time. And then what are, what, what are the features that they extract from it? So I, I don't remember exactly what are the features that they extracted. They said uh, very generally that they used KDE on the predicted. Uh, yeah, but the uh, question what, are the, what is the representation? What are the features of the trajectory? In space. No, they, they uh, use the feature extractor. They use here. They use the cell profiler. So it's just a bunch of um, calculated features over the images. And when we're looking over here, the user sees the images uh, itself, the image itself. But the input to the model is the trajectory of all the features that were calculated over. Yeah, the I know so the trajectory in this two-dimensional space, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the yeah. question, when you have a trajectory, you need to do feature extraction from this trajectory. And the, my question was, what were the, yeah. what were the features that based on them, they did the, the prediction? 
you have a trajectory in this two dimensional space, uh, you extract features, how? This is my question. And then based yeah. on that, you do prediction. And, and the second question there is uh, if you would use one of the other annotations, how would you change? And uh, I don't know, I mean, all the, would you really support the interclass? I mean, okay, so when you have extremes, it's obvious, but everything that happens in between, it's kind of, I don't know. So that, yeah. now, that, hmm? You're right. It's it's kind of fuzzy and and hand wavy, and we don't actually get to to specifically model the interclass changes. Uh, but it's some sort of of, of compromise between uh, uh, complete unsupervised learning and uh, in some way guided. Uh, it's, it's 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 some sort of, of guided uh, unsupervised learning. Amit, I, I sent you a paper, right? On 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 because I. Did I on, on this on on how how uh, uh, training uh, models to just say which is bigger than? than... But I didn't get it yet. <laughs> did I send it to you? Yes, you did. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and and the data here is public and the code is public, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's uh, it's already available on uh, ACC. I think they call. They call it, which is a, a popular pipeline for high content screening analysis. I think uh, there are a lot of things that can be done on this data, tested on this data. It could be a good, uh, could be a good project for students in this course if anyone is still looking for a project. Okay. Any other questions? Or okay, so it's my turn. And you wouldn't believe me, but uh, something happened that uh, that uh, never happened to me. I probably deleted my lecture. I don't know how, but I had it's not the dog ate my uh, homework, right? I mean, I had I had this uh, presentation. I just couldn't find it today, and I made it like a few weeks ago. So so, but but I, I always have something to talk about, so it's not a problem. Uh, it's just a shame because I had something very, I had, I had a plan and now my plan is uh, ruined, but I, I'll show you some other stuff. So, you didn't so you have presentations on your the, website. Yeah. Huh? You didn't you have presentations on your website. Well, can you speak one by one? What, what, what? I will Did talk. I? Uh, did, you, <laughs> did you upload it to the website? No, 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 I didn't because I was waiting. No, I probably deleted it. I was organizing things because I, ha I have the guest lectures and I have your, your slides and everything together. Probably I deleted something and- Recycle bin, something like this. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Maybe I have a recycle. I actually didn't check. I... So I was so happy that I was, uh, that I, I prepared it in advance and I didn't, you know, the, the, the talk with the lectures was ready. I made it like uh, several weeks ago. And now just before uh, Paul started talking, I was looking for it and, and, and I just couldn't find it. I looked in last year's site and I don't know what happened. It was supposed to be about, uh, anyway, I'll talk about something else now and maybe next week, next week I'll, I'll, I'll talk about if, I, if I'll have the mental strength to to remake it, it takes a lot of time to prepare these uh, lectures, as you probably, um, as you probably uh, appreciate. So, anyways, uh, I will talk about uh, <clears throat> a method that, that I developed, and or. You know what? Okay, I'll talk about the method that I developed. Uh, I have something else. I have pieces from something that I I, I, I didn't know if I have time to talk, but I probably will uh, about uh, something. You know what? Let's start with something else. Okay. One second. I want to show you it's one trick, which is 
which I think is worth showing because it's a, I see that it's useful in some other, in, in several applications. And I never thought about it until I saw this paper. So what you see here, it's a paper from 2014. It's not even, it's not even imaging based, but, but a lot of time we look at, uh, so basically the idea is here, it's based on single cell, uh, uh, single cell, uh, I don't know even what, maybe RNA seq or something. So, so you have single cell measurements. I mean, it is related to biology by cells, but it's not, uh, it's not uh, imaging based but it's uh, RNA levels or something like that, right? I don't know, or mass cytometry, something. So you have a lot of numbers. You have a, a large vector of numbers. Actually here, no, it's mass, mass of cytometry. So you have, it's not a large vector. It's you have uh, several tens of numbers of, of uh, protein express in uh, cells that are, uh, well, I don't remember the biology. Anyway, I didn't prepare for the class very well, as you understand. But anyway, um, what, what, what you get, now you want to look at the two proteins. And when you look at the data, okay, you do a scatter plot and you see something like this, right? Which is not very informative. And then uh, you do a heat map, which is a little more informative because here you, you cannot see the density, right? And here you can see very nicely the density, but uh, but still, everything, there is a, a very clear bias within the data into a specific location within the plane, within this two-dimensional plane of the two, the, the, the two proteins, right? So most of the data is, is, is uh, within this region. So their idea is actually pretty simple. Let's do, a, a, let's define conditional density, so conditional distribution. So the, they do these lines that you see here, these vertical lines, right? And then uh, they, they divide the distribution within each of these lines. So now the, the accumulation of everything that you'll see within the science is going to be one. And now once you do that, you can suddenly see a pattern in this space. You can see a pattern because now uh, you give the same way to the extreme values as the middle. So you now take into account if you have an, a, an extreme population, a, a, a rare subpopulation, you still give it the same weight as something in the, in the mass of the data. And once you do that, you suddenly you see this uh, very nice visualization of uh, where you can see the peak in the activity. So when protein A grows, protein B grows at some specific point, right? And then it gives you a lot more information regarding what's going on here. Uh, uh, the main limitation here is that you, you need to make sure that, I mean, you still need to have enough data to create distributions, right? From the very sparse regions in this space. But uh, with this type of measurements, which you have uh, uh, millions of them, so you have enough data, even in the extreme values, you have several tens or hundreds of data points, even in the extreme values, you can actually do this uh, reconstruction and then you can do this calculation and then you can get these uh, very nice uh, maps of how protein, the y-axis, how protein at the y-axis is changing its function uh, uh, as a conditional, right? Conditionally on what happens in the x-axis. And now when you think about it, you can, it, it's asymmetric. So you can look at it from the perspective of the, of the pro, of one protein. And then from the perspective of another protein, you're going to get different distributions, different patterns, dynamic patterns on how protein B changes with protein A changes. So once you can do that, you can start looking at the, the, the patterns and then say, okay, let's define a, a, a pattern of uh, which, of, of which, protein is activating which, which other protein. So let me walk you through that. It was, it was too quick, so I want you to, I want now to go through it uh, uh, more, um, you know, not in just one slide, but to go through a little bit, a few details. So the idea is uh, looking at protein co-occurrence and then, uh, and, and, and the trick is looking at the conditional distribution instead of looking at the joint distribution. So when we look at joint distribution of, uh, and here you have uh, two conditions, uh, before applying a stimulus and after applying a stimulus. And when you look at the uh, different measurements for correlation between those two, correlation and mutual, mutual information between those two channels, between those two proteins, 
you can see that uh, well you can see a small increase in the in the Pearson correlation and a small decrease in the mutual information practically you don't see any any change in these patterns right why because most of the weights that you have here come what most of uh, of what you calculate in uh, in uh, the mutual information and in, in the uh, in the correlation comes from uh, the mass of the data, right? So you give the mass of the data all the weight when you calculate something. So the extreme values are not getting a lot of weight and then you get something very similar here. But when you do their trick, so when we look at the, at the, at the conditional distribution, right? So each time we define here different uh, regions in space and we calculate the conditional di distribution, you suddenly see a very different pattern coming on. Uh, sorry, this is the joint distribution. Sorry, this is the joint distribution. Sorry, the joint distribution. So in the joint distribution, you see, basically you see that uh, there is a lot of change here, but the change is, is uh, most of the change is in a very specific region, right? Different regions, but in very specific regions, but still it's not enough to learn anything about the relation between those two proteins, as you can see from the quantitative readouts, right? But when we look at the, at the conditional distribution, we can see that the patterns are very different. The patterns of how protein Y is changing as function of X. And, 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 and this gives us, and now when we define a measure for, for, for this pattern, we can see that, the, that there is a much larger difference, which is more resembling the, the reality here in this case. We see different patterns, okay? And now they define different measures for uh, for you know they define here where is the maximum here and what happens uh, above and below and, uh, and and normalizing here the weight and you can see and what are the the inflection points so where is the point that it starts jumping and so there are different measurements and now when you look and look at these measurements you can see that there there are a, a major change in, in some of them that reflect the reality reflect the biology what ha what really happens in this data. Uh, but what is the meaning that on the X, on the high levels of X, you have less samples? Isn't there any meaning for that? I mean, um, I just, I mean you, you can think about it. You have, when you look at the, the, at the joint uh, distribution or the marginal distribution, you can see that, you know, it looks kind of normal, right? Normally distributed. So yeah. most of the data is located somewhere and then it decays, right? In all direction, in X direction and in Y direction. So basically it's basically both in, at the left and at the right of the PXY, right? At the, at the joint distribution, it's, it's almost a, a, a normal distribution, right? It's, it's very close to a normal distribution, yeah. what you see here. Yeah, and then you cannot learn anything from that, but, but when you split it here. No, I, it, yeah, but, but again, we, we, there, there, there is a, a unique pattern here yeah. that is hidden and it's hidden in, in small numbers, right? So, so when we talk about heterogeneity, when we talk about the uh, unique subpopulation, so this is in the context of cell biology, right? When we want to look at the unique subpopulation, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's very important to be able to identify them and say how they, how they act. But it's also, it's also a good visualization for, I would say for any data. I mean, when you see this type yeah. of data, you can think about using this trick. I mean, for me, it was, it was useful multiple times. This is why I was trying to push it, to push it yes. to the cloth, right? To push it to the cloth, like also, because I think it's a... Yeah, it's an interesting trick, yes. Yeah, it, it, and it's worth knowing. I mean, you just do it and you get a visualization, you can quantify it. It's pretty it's pretty simple and sweet, right? And it can, can give you a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, data. Okay. Okay, so what do I have here? Yeah, that's the problem. Uh, measure the decrease in the uncertainty of y given x. Okay, so this is the uh, spread of y, and then yeah, okay. Then you get when you when you look at the sub at the sub region, of course, you get much less variability. So here in the y, you get all the variability. And when when you when you uh, focus on the subpopulation, of course, you get much less from the variability. Uh, yeah, and this is okay. This is an explanation. So 
So Yuval, you are, you are new here, but I said that I lost my slides for today. My, the dog ate my homework. So I was, I'm now uh, improvising with the old slides that I have from somewhere else, from something else because, yeah. So anyway, uh, so, so basically this is an ex explanation why it works because uh, what dominates the Pearson correlation or what dominates the, the um, mutual information is, is the region where the mass, mass of the data is at, right? So now when we, when we give the same weight for different regions here, uh, we get uh, a measure that is uh, much more informative in finding these patterns. And also it's asymmetric, which is really, really cool, I think. Okay, so let's see what, 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 what they, they could do with that. So basically what they, do, what they did here, they showed, basically they show how uh, the y-axis is changing as, as a function of x. So if you think about it from a molecular perspective, you have a protein x, nothing happens in y, and then at some point, X go beyond the threshold and up, look at this uh, increase, right? So there is a, a, a very steep uh, increase in protein Y. So once you see something like that, you can think, okay, so protein uh, uh, Y is, uh, is, a, is activated by protein X, right? And you can put measures from that based on, 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 on this, uh, you, can, you can model this pattern and, 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 and put numbers into that, how, how early it changes and how fast it changes, right? These are the measures that, uh, that I showed you before. And now once you have this, you can put numbers on how this uh, effect of uh, the dependency of Y on X changes y, y, once you perturb your system. So, we perturb our system, and basically you can learn new biology from that by saying, okay, when we perturb our system, the, the, the dependency on, of Y on X is changing in, in this and that way. Okay, and you can measure that. Here is another example where you do not see a clear pattern, right? There is something very, very messy here that there is, there is no pattern here between this, uh, 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 yeah, so you see, you get very low values, but when you when you do this uh, stimulation, when you do this perturbation, you suddenly get an increase. And uh, yeah, and you can get also similar. Okay, so that's that's the the usage. And now another cool thing that they did is try to to define if not just a, a, an edge but a network. And basically, what they did. They looked at the pairwise relation. So here you see that this uh, PSL is uh, activated by PCD, right? Uh, and then after that, you can see the PSL P76, right? The Y axis here is activating some PERC12. Uh, and this happens later. And then you can see the PERC12 activates the PS6. And this happens even even later. So basically, what you what you can now say, you can find here a pathway. You can find here an, a, a, a direction where information flows within the signaling network within the cell, which I think is cool. Uh, okay, and um, and uh, and then to 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 validate. So yeah, I mean, I, I really like this paper also because they did, uh, it's also a paper from Dana, Dana Fair Lab. I, I told you I, I, I like her work. She's very, uh, so uh, how do you say that? Uh, Thorough. Thorough. Yeah, there is a better word for that I was looking. Anyway, uh, she's very, I mean, she, 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 she's so with her methodology, okay? I mean, she's, the, her papers are always, you see the methodology, it's, it's done really, Comprehensively, it's really you know it's really systematic. I, I really so so here they did also validation on trying to identify to, to compare to different uh, measurements and try to see okay if my question is where is the peak, so where is the peak of uh, of uh, activation after how much time, right? So you have here one, two, three, four, five, six because you have here six time points, and the question is when the activation starts, right? After how much time? When you do some stimulation, stimulation, how much, uh, how, wh wh when, when do you start to see changes? So the dream eye works better than, uh, than other measures. 
uh, here is the prediction, right? The accuracy of the prediction and the other measures that do a lousy job and we might do a better job. And again, also in, in another example. So yeah, so I think that's it. And, and then what they did eventually, they wanted to say uh, they had different uh, uh, cell subtypes and they wanted to compare the change of some perturbations. So say they did some treatment and they wanted to see how the network changes in response to this treatment. So now you can really, you can use a very simple trick, right? And actually take it a long way to actually start to understand how a cell operates with all, all, everything, you know, it's, it's not, the, it's not the, 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 the ultimate truth, right? It could be wrong, but it gives you a tool now to raise a hypothesis. So now you can get, you can say things about activation over time in different systems and uh, different work. I, I think it's, it's beautiful. So I, I really like this, uh, this paper. Okay, so that was one small thing that I, 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 I couldn't resist when looking for, for my leftover the slides uh, hysterically while, Paul, while, while trying also to listen to Paul, uh, I found that. And then uh, with myself, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm not sure if to do it today or maybe next time, or maybe next time to talk. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about the papers that I was planning to, to talk about anyway. So I was planning to start talking about, uh, about uh, and it also relates to what Paul was talking about, about uh, big data sets, about, uh, about the massive resources that uh, can be used now in, in the field. And, and and it's something I actually also wrote about the perspective in 2000 and I organized the conference about it in 2017 on 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 a, on a cell image data reuse so reusing the same data to learn something new to develop tools which is kind of a people do it already and to learn new biology. So you can use the same, the data is so complex and usually only the surface is scratched of it. You can actually, and maybe I'll show you next time or not, I'm not sure it was part of my presentation, show you how, uh, how I did it. I mean, how I took it, all data from some people and reanalyzed it in different ways and learn some, you know, it started by motivate by, by my motivation that uh, they, they did something uh, um, not completely right. They had some faults in their analysis, I thought. And then I wanted to show that they, that they are wrong, but eventually it was much more, eventually they were right by, 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 by Fuchs, right? By, by, by Lobe Havana. I mean, their conclusion was right, but the way that they got there was completely wrong. So I, 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 I reanalyzed their, their data and showed what was the real explanation for what they said. Anyway. And, 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 and another example that I might show you is, uh, is the tools that I developed based on existing data. Anyway, the idea that existing data can be reused for computer science, it's, it's obvious. I mean, everybody are, know, everybody know about, knows and appreciates that, and there is no dispute about that for sure. In biology, if you look at the bioinformatics, at omics, it's also, I mean, the huge data set that came out, uh, uh, for example, in cancer, TCGA and, and, and other resources are now, you know, many, many bioinformaticians are developing tools based on them and using them. And biologists are using them to raise hypotheses and computational biologists are, are using this data to, to also raise computationally driven hypotheses, data driven hypotheses. Uh, so this is already established. In, in cell biology, like everything else, we are behind which is good because it could be good and could be bad because it, it could be an opportunity. And I'll tell you a few examples why it's, it's not always good. So, uh, and, 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 and actually recently there were these, uh, there are these huge data sets that are generated and they are, I mean, currently people, these mostly generated by philanthropic entities. So the Hans Zuckerberg Initiative, yeah, the guy from Zuckerberg is the Google guy, right? And uh, the Ellen Institute of Cell Science and the HHMI uh, Genelia Research Campus, they are all generating this, uh, and, and the uh, Human Protein Atlas, all generating these huge data sets. And uh, mostly, by the way, about the organization of a single cell. 
so organelle composition of single cells. Uh, and uh, these data sets are open for the, you know, and, and, and very few computational people are actually trying to use this data. Uh, and I think it's, it's a huge opportunity. So as I, say, as I told, to, told the tall poll, uh, I'm organizing a conference this year in the American Society of Cell Biology, a subgroup on, on this topic, because I want, I, want, I want the people who generated this data and other people to actually have an open discussion, where the field is going, where, what, what, what are we going to, okay, so we can generate huge data sets, which are very important and have a lot of information, how can we mine them effectively to learn something new? How can we integrate them to learn something new? And I think this is, this is a, big, a big thing in uh, cell biology. I also think that it will drive uh, computational scientists into cell biology because once you have public data sets and you're not dependent on some biologists to then generate specific data for you to implement your ideas, at least some of them, it's, uh, it's very attractive. Hello, Asaf. In, uh, I come from the omics uh, field and uh... You cannot publish a paper without publishing your data also. Like it's, you can't do it. Yeah, so it's also, like the, yeah, this, is, the... this is part of the culture. This is part of the culture now in, in, in domics, it's already established. Uh, in structural biology, I also think that it's established. In cell biology, it's, it's, it's becoming much better now, but I'm still getting, I, I'm reviewing papers, a lot of papers and uh, data will be uh, available upon request or something that makes me completely crazy upon reasonable requests, which this kills me when I, I'm looking for that in every paper that, so data and code. So, and, and still, I mean, even in, in, in major journals, you could get away with that. Uh, and you can, you can say, okay, I'm not putting my data. I mean, you'll have to do some, I mean, now it's becoming less and less um, acceptable but uh, you can still you can still avoid that if you really want to. So I think we are in the right direction, but it's still uh, it's still going to take and some it's time. A cultural change. And, pa and part of the reason uh, is the variability of uh, the imaging data. So omics, uh, or you know uh, you know DNA sequencing, or or proteomics, or whatever. I mean the the, the representations. And the way to encode the data is uh, is less complex than an image. Image is, is just you know an image is just a very complex to present with it because you always have the the step of feature extraction. So you take an image and you try to to create numbers from it, which is a very complex step. So this is one thing. And the second reason, in my opinion, is that um, that there is a lot of uh, variability in the way that people do experiments. So there are tons of microscopes. There are tons of, uh, mm -hmm. of you can you can you can uh, label your cells with different uh, markers. You can do different you know you can do the cells in different. And so so every experiment, I think the variability is much higher, which makes it much more difficult to to um, harmonize data or to integrate data across different experiments. Uh, yeah. So this is the second. I, I think it's a big limitation, and the third limitation is uh, the size of the data. So imaging data uh, yeah. <laughs> is huge. It's huge compared to omics. And, you know, it's just, wh who is going to pay for that? Who is going to pay for that? Where are you going to upload that? And who, who is going to pay yeah, for that? Yeah, it's uh, much like, yeah, you're right. It's like, uh, yeah, a lot more. <laughs> yeah, and, and when you combine that uh, a lot of these data sets are not going to be useful to anyone, so it is important maybe for reproducibility or to replicate the results, but it's not going to be used for any reanalysis. And the size of this data together it brings to a situation where it's not always so you need to really, and there are papers, opinion papers on what data should be uh, public and how, I mean, all of mm -hmm. that, it's, it's, you know, there is a lot of discussion around that, uh, which is, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I think it's it's very interesting to be part of it. I'll tell you another limitation. This is also from my personal experience, and this is why I said that, that there are advantages. So it's very virgin. I mean, the field is very bituli, right? I mean, you can, mm -hmm. I, I think, you can go, you can dig into, into this data, and you can find big answers, questions, answers to big questions in these public data sets, because you are, because you know, people didn't really. Not a lot of people have thought about it and tried to use this data. 
Mm -hmm. One disadvantage is the noisiness of the data because you're going to be the first person who's going to play with this data. It's probably all the bugs, all the all the balagan. You know, it's not that the thousands of people. You know, when you look at the MNIST uh, data set, I mean, you know, there are no bugs. Everything is, uh, you know, it's, it's yeah. easy. Yeah. When you look at the data that was generated by someone and no one else used before, it's going to be messy. Okay, so this is one uh, disadvantage. And the second is a more a cultural disadvantage. I think it's getting better these days, but I have an example of a paper that I submitted that I told you about this reanalysis of all data with completely new insights, completely new methodology and insights. Really nice paper. I really, I, I love it. Uh, again, I'm biased because it's me, but I, I, I really think it, it, it was really cool. And I'm actually take pride in that it was reanalysis of all data. And when we went to peer review, uh, one of the reviewers said, listen, uh, this is all data. As, as, this is all data. So it's not good or something like that. And uh, so uh -huh. in principle, if I would have replicated the same experiment and did the analysis, right, they mm -hmm. would be happy. But since it's all data, it's bad. So this is like, I'm just giving you an example of a very uh, obsolete way of thinking. Of data, yeah. Very non-computer computer science way of thinking of the data. And uh, I think it's getting better. I mean, this was in, uh, the paper was published in the end of 2015. So it was like uh, in, in the process, I don't know, 2015, early 2015. Now we are six years uh, in the future. I, I think people start to appreciate that it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's something that is worth, um, um, uh, you know, that it's, that it's an, that there is an option like that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So uh, one of the, maybe the first and the most, um, the, there were a few before it, but this is the first uh, series, the first uh, uh, systematic uh, uh, resource for imaging data. It's called the image data resource. Uh, you can see the paper was published in uh, the, the later parts of 2017. Uh, and what they do, I can actually open that. They have a nice website. I even, I just, I just posted the my data for, so let's see if, uh, yeah, you see, here is my data, interpretable deep learning and cover solar properties. This is my, yeah, Zaritsky et al. This is the last paper that I published. So, so and, and you have your tissue IDR, image data resources and cell IDR, which is the cell uh, data resource. And you can go here and you can see all these data sets and you can start filtering by different things, right? Time-lapse imaging. Ah, we're in the time-lapse imaging. Uh, protein localization, yeast, so this is the model system, high content screening in humans, etc. And this is the number of studies, the number of uh, papers, the data set. Now the IDR, uh, they have a very clear uh, strategy they, 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 they first decide if your data is worth, worth a while, worth depositing, again, because it's, it's a lot of data. It's, it's you know, uh, they need to, it's, it's a philanthropic, you know, they're not for, they don't, they're, they don't do it to get rich or anything, but uh, it's still, someone needs to pay for that. So I think uh, it's mostly supported by philanthropy. Let's see, probably they have that in the main page. Some credits, who pays for that? Yeah, here, I mean, it's a European initiative and a global uh, bioimaging and the Horizon, it's a EU initiative. So you see a lot of people are, a lot of uh, entities, governmental entities are, uh, are uh, supporting this, uh, this initiative. And uh, yeah, so if you look at the paper, the one thing that I wanted to go through is they show the very simple example of uh, data integration. So how did they do that? They looked at the, uh, I mean, it's really trivial, but it, it was just showing how you can take different data sets and, and try to learn something new, trying to combine them in order to learn something new. It was really very uh, naive maybe, but, uh, but, 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 but I think it's a, it's a good, uh, I mean, it's, you know, they, they want to show basically what you could maybe do or 
could think of ideas on how to how to integrate. So start with an hypothesis, look for the data that is relevant for that, analyze it, then have another, then, then come up with some uh, result, and then have another hypothesis, and look, then look for that that, that that can help answer this hypothesis. It's very not biology-like because biology likes to focus on one system. Cell biologists focus on their own system, which also it's good because it's reduced variability and you know it's kind of uh, you control everything. But I think that there is still this idea of doing data-driven and jumping between data sets. If you have a powerful enough data set, could be also uh, useful. So here they look at different uh, properties. Let's uh, increase that. And uh, you can see here different uh, uh, molecules. They looked at screens, high throughput screens, and they look at phenotype that relates to um, um, that relate to the protein uh, localization, and this is the nucleoside, the different phenotype. And then they decide to focus on the phenotype of the elongated cell, what you can see here, the size of the circle, the number of studies that they had, and and the size is how many phenotypes they had. And then what they did here, they, co they combined different studies. So the color code, I think, are different studies. Yeah, here. So there are different studies. Uh, and so you see in color code, you see there is the red network, there is the blue network, and there is the green network. And there are some commonalities. So they combined everything together, and they created a new network. Uh, or, and then they looked at the, at the network, and they correlated. They looked at, at the network and they, they correlated the outcome of, uh, of cell elongation, the phenotype of cell elongation to specific proteins. And, and then they could show that cell elongation is linked to this and that uh, pathway or something like that. Okay, so I think this was a good uh, um, uh, demonstration. And then the second thing that I want to show you, just because it's cool, what is that? Ah, this is the protein. The second is, is, is the human protein atlas, which is another human, which is another uh, nice data set. And they also have all kinds of things. Uh, one of the things that they have is trying to, they give you a, localiz a localization pattern of a specific protein, and you need to predict, and there was a competition about that, the Kaggle competition that actually drew a lot of attention and a lot of computational people that they had to, to predict where is it localized to, to what organelles are these proteins localized to. Uh, and one thing that I thought was, uh, was just, just cool, and I heard uh, Emma Lundberg talk about it. She has a, she has a very good, very cool uh, uh, slide on that. It's already an old paper. I mean, it's not very old. Uh, 2000, end of 2018. But what, what, what they did is they, they used citizen science. So basically they wanted the people to, I mean, they had many, many images and they wanted to annotate them. And they didn't want to use the, the expensive biologist time. So what they did, they created the computer game. And let's see. They created the computer game, maybe. Yeah, so these are the, the data and you, need, you needed to, the, the gamer had to annotate them eventually, but they created this computer game, which uh, they did, they had the training tutorial for the players. And then, uh, and, and they, they got from that, um, eventually they got from that, this is it, they had, 350,000 players that contributed to a 23.7 million image classification. And uh, I don't remember where they have here the number of, uh, of uh, so they calculated the time that people spent on it, the labor that they got from people to, to play with this game and actually annotate images. And they also, they did some cool stuff, which I don't think that you can see here, but uh, they, they try to show uh, how good are amateurs, right? That people who have no idea about biology learn about this. So they did a lot of cross validations, right? To make sure that, uh, that the people are not doing like uh, crappy annotations for them. And uh, they ranked uh, the players and they actually 
uh, she, she they found uh, one player that was like uh, better than expert even. So someone who, were really, who was really good at finding patterns within this data. And she said in her talks that she was trying to recruit him to the lab, right? <laughs> so good at finding patterns, so let's recruit him to the lab. So anyway, it was a fun talk and I think it's, it's a cool idea. And, and now there are more uh, efforts in doing citizen science, right? Trying to use basically, you know, to trick people to do labor for free. Uh, anyway, I, th I think it's a cool, it's a cool thing too. So this is the combination of a public data set with citizen science that can actually uh, eventually create a, re a better resource. And then the resource is used for training and testing and using and giving it to computer scientists to actually do predictions. So it's kind of a nice loop of everything integrated together. The data set here is uh, it's also, it could be useful for course project if anyone is interested in the uh, uh, human uh, protein atlas. It contains, usually you have a, a, a cell and a landmark. So like a couple of uh, uh, organelles, I think the nucleus, maybe the membrane, which are common to all of the images. And then you have a target protein and you want to use that in order to the prediction, the classification task, you want to classify to where this protein is located on what organelles a protein is located. Okay. So, and uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that's enough for today after the catastrophe of uh, the worst thing is that idea. Yeah. Well, Anyway, I'll prepare it for next year. And I don't have the mental, uh, the mental uh, strength to do, to do it again this year because I also read the papers when I do it and I think about it and I'm not going to do it again now without uh, the extra benefits. I, I'm going probably to tell you a little bit like I did now, like show you some highlights from papers and stuff like that. Uh, anything that you want to say or ask? I want again to remind everybody uh, the Moshuvim, please fill it up. Ah, I have, I, yeah, I wanted to, talk, to say about that also. Please fill it up. It is important. Last year from the Mashuvim, I learned what, uh, for example, I learned what uh, uh, lectures were good, what, what lectures were, you know, entertaining and, and uh, inspiring and uh, insightful, and what, le what lectures were not as good. And I, I switched these, uh, these lectures. I didn't bring them this year, uh, the bad lectures, but I brought some new, so anyway. So, so, so tell me what you think. And one example uh, that didn't work last year was the, um, was the student presentations. And I got a lot of feedback about that, right? Student presentation uh, didn't work because this and that. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and, and I, think, I think it went much better this year. And, and I, I'm still going to, and last, to, tomorrow, and the next week I'm still going to ask you for feedback. So if you have, I mean, if you have feedback that you can tell me in my face, I mean, I'm, I'm good at getting, uh, I want to hear the good and the bad. So please tell me, I, I want to learn and I want to improve. Uh, so this, for example, the, the, the student lectures came in the Moshuvim and face to face, people just told me, you know, you wasted half of the course on uh, people just uh, mumbling about something that they, you know, and, and, and now it's much more organized with this way. I also think that the, I hope that the projects are going to be more focused and last year, because last year it was just, I, I just got eventually the, the a, a few people approached me to consult, uh, but the vast majority just uh, submitted something eventually and a lot of it was uh, not good, I think. Uh, and there was also feedback about um, uh, aligning expectations. So there was uh, like uh, two or three students who came expecting that this is going to be a deep learning course, and it's not. Uh, I, I thought I, I, I did a good alignment of expectation before the course last time, but apparently I didn't. So, I mean, this, so I just want to show you, I mean, we, we were told by the rector that it gives motivation to fill, it, to fill up the Mashovim. So I'm trying to motivate you. Anyway, uh, I'll see you next week. I'm not sure on what I'll talk exactly, but uh, it will be fun. Anyway, I'll summarize. So, so where are they? Where are Mashovim? The what? Where can I find the Mashovim that you want me to fill? I have uh, to get it by email? Yeah, you're Keep, supposed to get yeah, it. Yeah, it's in the mail. It's in the university mail. mail.